Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad Podcast. My name is Mike Keenitz, and today I'm interviewing Rick Olderman, who is a physical therapist. I am asking him questions from our audience that you guys submitted about leg pain issues, including hip, knee, and ankle, and different foot issues. So without further ado, here's Rick. Well, welcome back to the program, Rick. Thanks for having me, Mike. Today, we are going to talk about leg pain questions from our audience. So our first question we have is from Facebook. It is from Laura E. And it is the best hip stretches for hip pain, non-arthritic. Yeah. So, uh, well, Laura, I guess my first question would be, how do you uh, know that stretching is going to solve this? So a a lot of people uh, imagine that because their hip feels tight, it's a stretching issue. And I'll be happy to share some of those with you. However, it may be a hip tracking issue actually that's causing muscles to be in spasm. And I'll I'll kind of show you what I'm talking about. So one of the most common uh, problems with the hip is something called an anterior femoral glide syndrome. And what that means is that here's the femur. So my skeleton, here's forward, all right? And here's the femur. The anterior means forward. Femoral is the femur. Glide means it's sliding. Syndrome means there's a a, a cacophony of issues that are surrounded uh, and affected by this, and and that cause it. So what what is happening typically with chronic hip pain is that with anterior femoral glide syndrome, you can imagine that if the thigh bone is migrating forward in the hip socket where it shouldn't be, then it's going to put pressure on the front of the hip. If you have a femoral acetabular impingement, then this will aggravate that. It, it can cause groin pain. Uh, it could cause labral tears. And then other people have pain on the side of their hip, and it's called bursitis, labeled bursitis. But really, bursitis, itis just means inflammation. So really, uh, that doesn't really tell us anything. So why would the bursa be inflamed? Well, because you've got the IT band coming down over the side of the hip. And when it's migrating forward, it's in a position it shouldn't be in, and it rubs that bursa excessively. Because not only is the IT band working on that bursa, but now you've got this sliding movement working on it, and it causes bursitis. Then there are deep muscles in the back of the pelvis that are trying to, that attach to this thigh bone that are helping to try to control it. And so those, the piriformis is the one that gets uh, mentioned the most. Uh, those become irritated in, in spasm because it, their little tiny little pinky muscles trying to hold this big whole system here in place. And that's not really their job. Their job is to be supporting actors. And so uh, these, be, they, these get into spasm, cause piriformis syndrome or other types of issues, sciatic pain, SI joint issues, and so forth. Uh, and so um, the reason that this is happening, though, is because the butt muscles are not firing. The butt muscles are the big hand muscles. They're, they have many jobs, and they're powerful. And they start from this area of the of the of the back and they move over here and they attach into this thigh bone. And what they do is they create a pivot point for that thigh bone to pivot in the socket. And when the butt muscles aren't firing, then this hip bone starts to migrate forward and this anterior femoral glide syndrome starts. And then people have all sorts of pain. It's either front, side, back, or global hip pain. It's labeled arthritic pain. Uh, so really the cause is an anterior femoral glide syndrome issue. Why is, why is the butt not working? It's usually because of a gait problem. And what's happening with the gait is that typically people are locking their knees when they're standing or walking. That turns off the butt muscles. And so uh, what you want to do is simply stop locking your knees, start softening your knees. And uh, this will um, help turn the butt muscles on. And so the other exercise I would recommend, I, I have an exercise in one of my, in my hip pain program called, uh, it's a gluteal pump exercise where you're on your elbows and knees, and then you lift a leg like this to isolate the butt. I find that most butt strengthening exercises are multi-joint and it doesn't, it's not really isolating the butt because there's so many ways to compensate, uh, for that butt not turning on. The quads can help, the hamstrings can help, the back muscles can help. And I find that this butt pump that I have in my home program 
isolates the gluteals and helps your brain connect to them very well and turns them on well. But no matter how much strengthening you do in the hip butt muscles, if you don't walk correctly, then uh, they'll, you'll never use the strength that you're trying to train. Okay, so that's probably in, I mean, almost all hip pain that I see, especially chronic hip pain, has some degree of anterior femoral glide syndrome as the root cause. Okay, but your question was about stretches. So uh, the stretches, so mostly you want to target the, the muscles that are crossing the hip joint. Well, one of those biggies is the thigh muscles in the front of the, of the leg here. Um, I don't like most of the thigh muscle stretches out there because they're not isolating the pelvis and back. And like, for instance, if you stand and grab the back of your heel, your pelvis gets to tilt forward and your back gets to arch. And yes, you might feel a little bit of a thigh stretch, but really what all you're doing is, is making the pelvis tilt forward in the back arch and you're not getting as pure of a thigh stretch as you could get. The one that I recommend, and, and so I'm going to try and pull this up and, and share it with you. Okay, so this is the one that I recommend most people do. This is a level one for people with severely tight thigh muscles and who may have a hard time controlling their spine. You can see this leg that's up and she's holding onto that knee. Pulling that knee back towards the chest is protecting the pelvis and spine. So you get a pure stretch in the thigh. Now, this is level two. This is what I have most people work up to and do and, and usually start off with unless they're in severe pain. So we start with both knees to the chest first, and then you hold on to one knee and keep that knee close to the chest because that's protecting your back and pelvis. And then you lower the other leg down with the knee bent at 90 degrees. And so when you do this, you're stretching across both joints that the thigh muscle is crossing. And this gets into more of a pure stretch. All right. So the knee should be bent at 90 degrees. The thigh should be able to rest on the table here. And this knee, when your thigh muscles are tight, this knee tends to migrate forward because we're all goal oriented and we want to think that our thigh isn't tight. And so we allow this knee to subconsciously move forward, which lets this whole system go down. And you say, oh, well, that's not tight at all. Well, just pull the knee back to your chest and you'll feel the tightness that we're targeting here. And I usually do 30, second, 30 to 60 seconds per side uh, and twice per side each time I do this. And if you're just starting this, try it once. And if you're sure that it doesn't cause any pain, then I would probably do that twice a day. All right. So uh, the other one would be uh, the hamstrings also cross the, the hip joint. And so uh, I like doing a unilateral hamstring stretch where, for instance, you sit on your bed and you have one leg up on the bed and the other leg is on the floor. And so this helps you find asymmetries in the uh, tightness of the hamstrings. So I, I, that's why I like doing a lot of unilateral uh, stretching, strengthening, and so forth, because it helps us see where our asymmetries are. And if you've got chronic pain, likely there's an asymmetry going on in an area of your, uh, of your body that you're unaware of. And to that end, uh, what, if there are asymmetries, usually, for instance, if you've got right hip pain, usually that pelvis will then rise higher and the rib cage will rise, it will lower down, and it'll create something called a side bending problem. This is what it basically is, and which then can pinch nerve roots and so forth. So uh, solving uh, the side bending problem is easy. All you have to do is solve the, the, the reason it's happening is because of all, some problem down that leg usually. And so uh, once you solve this tracking issue that will solve the side bending problem too and once you fix your gait pattern that's why the side bending problem is happening all right so i think we got the quad stretch we got the hamstring stretch we have anterior femoral glide syndrome we've included the side bending problem and how to and oh the easy way to test if you've got a side bending problem is just take off your shirt and have someone take a picture of your back usually you'll see a crease a bigger crease on the side of the side bending problem all right, so that, that'll confirm that that's happening. So let's see. I, I think that's about all I've got for that one. You, yes, you address these problems with uh, Bob's son, which video is coming out soon. Or if you're watching now, it probably already came out. And also my evaluation. So this is uh, all very relatable to us. Yes, yeah. Once, once you understand how things work as a system, you'll feel like you're repeating yourself all the time. 
because it's usually very similar systemic problems that are causing all of these problems. So the same systemic problem can cause hip pain in one person, knee pain in another, SI joint in a third, uh, you know, sciatic pain in another, and back pain in a, in a fifth. So um, all sorts of problems, but it's all usually due to the same root causes. Right. All right. Next question is from Carol H. Uh, the wording is a little different, but I think I can figure it all out. So thoughts on hip replacements and structural problems developing. So I believe Carol had a hip replacement already by the way she's wording this. Uh, she's saying she has sciatica, knee stability, I'm presuming knee stability issues, arthritis on the top of the arch of the foot on the same side as the hip that required a second replacement. Is this a possible connection and how to proceed in checking for a common thread? Absolutely, there's a, there's a connection. And we kind of just went over that in the previous question too. So, you know, you may have had a hip replacement. Well, prior to that hip replacement, the reason that hip may have broken down in the first place was because of that anterior femoral glide syndrome that I was just talking about. And why did the anterior femoral glide syndrome happen? Because of poor gluteal function or butt, butt muscle function. And why did the butt mu muscle function, why is that poor? Because of a gait pattern problem. All right. So if you had a hip replacement and now you're running into similar or the same problems, it means that you haven't solved the system's uh, uh, problems that led to the original hip breakdown in the first place. So now the hip's not complaining because it's a brand new hip. It's metal. You don't have to worry about anything. But now your other areas are because that was the compensating point. Now you've got other compensating points and you've developed sciatica and other other aches and pains throughout the system. Well, uh, ultimately, it's going to go back to your gait pattern that you are likely locking your knees, and that is turning off the key gluteal muscles, which is setting up this whole system to fail, because the butt muscles don't only control the tracking of the thigh bone. They control the rotation of the knee when you're walking. They control the orientation of the pelvis when you're, when you're standing and walking. And the pelvis then controls the low back system, all right? So, and then controlling the rotation of the thigh bone then controls the knee joint and what's going on there. And frankly, it also controls the foot and ankle joint too. So if the, th if the hip joint is uncontrolled, well, it's all linked together, just like the song. And so then the whole system is, is in flux. And especially if it's on the same side, well, it's, it's already given you your answer that you've got other problems that, that you, we need to solve here. So, um, and likely you have that side bending problem too, as a consequence of this and developing that side bending, because that's your brain's way of getting off this painful side. Your brain over time lifts that pelvis like that. Let's see if I can get that there. That might be it. So over time, your brain lifts that pelvis because it's like stepping on a sharp tack. Your brain's saying, Hey man, that hurts. I'm going to, I got to get off of that thing. So what it does is it hikes that pelvis up to get off of that painful area. Whatever area that is down the whole chain, your brain is trying to get off of that. And that's what's creating the side bending problem. Well, the muscles that lift the pelvis attach to the rib cage. So it's also going to pull the rib cage down, creating compression on that side of the spine and the, the roots of sciatic nerve pain. So uh, you're absolutely correct. So what you need to do, I think, is find a therapist who understands things from more of a system and will look at your whole lower body system uh, to see what's going on here. Now, an, uh, an easy gross test that you can do is find a chair or stool that you can sit on that you think you can stand up with with one leg. Now, you can use your hand to, to balance when you're doing this if you want to. But uh, so you, you lift up one leg up in the air and then you stand up and sit down using a single leg and then you switch legs. And you'll probably find that one of your legs is significantly weaker than the other. And it's usually the leg that's very painful. So this is telling you that you have asymmetries, uh, significant asymmetries between the strength of your two legs. And so when you do strengthening exercises, you should be doing them unilaterally uh, with each, you know, one leg and then the other. So you can tease out what these strength differences are and pay attention to your gait. And all of my home programs, uh, they're, I mean, all the exercises are unilateral. So you'll discover exactly what the problems are. Now, uh, another theme that, that may be contributing to this is that 
you could have a tension pattern throughout your whole body that's feeding into this whole uh, problem. So what I mean by that is that we have fascia superhighways that run through our body from our head to our toes. Fascia is basically connective tissue. And so this connective tissue uh, isn't, doesn't only include connective tissue. It includes everything that it envelops, which are muscles, ligaments, tendons, bones, nerves, blood vessels. I mean, uh, you know, fascia holds together our, our visceral system. You know, so fascia is the glue that holds the whole body together. And then the, there are these super highways of fascia that run through the body. So if you have been in pain for a long time and have been walking kind of uh, incorrectly for a long time, it's likely that your body has developed tension around this whole system of movement. That tension pattern, so there's a super, uh, there's a super highway of fascia that runs down the back from the head to the toes. There's one that runs down the side from the head to the toes. There's a couple that run down the front. There's a spiral one that spirals up the body. And so uh, I have found what's helpful are somatic, uh, I've created some somatics audio lessons that help you uh, uh, unlock all these tension patterns from your body. And a lot of people who have chronic pain, uh, this is the beginning of them solving their chronic pain. Because if we can unlock everything first, then you can get everything to work better. And that's what I usually counsel most people to do is to unlock their systems first and then start fixing the systems. And so, sorry, that was a long question to a, a short, a, a long answer to a short question, but you're, you're very astute in your observation that, hey, is this whole thing connected? Absolutely, it's connected. And there are many connections, but you're on the right track. There are asymmetries in your lower body system that are at the root of all of these. And your walking pattern is one of the biggest problems. Do you want to talk about an uh, easy way to not lock your knees when you walk? Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, the easiest way. So uh, first, first of all, let's talk about what I'm talking about when I say lock your knees. So if, if, you, if you're watching this video, just stand up for a second. And you'll notice that if you stand for more than a minute or two, your knees are locked backwards in a straightened position. This is an energy conservation move that we do to conserve energy because now we get to stand on our joints instead of using our leg muscles to do this, all right? However, this has consequences. One of the consequences I mentioned was it turns off those ever important gluteal muscles in the back of your hip. You'll also notice that if, you, if you're locking your knees and you unlock them and then you lock them again, you'll notice that your back also arches more when you lock your knees. And if you have back or sciatic pain, this is one of the root causes of that back and sciatic pain. So unlocking the knees will help solve back, sciatic, hip, knee, and foot issues for all of these reasons. It helps turn on muscles that are supposed to be turned on, and it balances the two sides of your body too. So and so what now that you understand what I'm talking about with locking the knees and unlocking the knees, and there are repercussions throughout the body with this uh, behavior, so the, an easy way that I do is I put a little piece of tape on the backs of my patient's knees and when they're soft, and then when they lock their knees, they get that instant feedback from the tape that tells them that they're locking their knees. And so then they get, oh, oh I've got to unlock that. And that is hugely helpful because this is an unconscious movement habit that your brain will not recognize and, and pay attention to for you because you've already trained your brain to make this your normal way of moving. So your brain will really only be alerted to the idea that you are unlocking your knees. If you lock your knees, your brain's going to shut down and say all of those alert systems and say, ah, I'm back to where you taught me to be, right? So sometimes you need a little bit of helper and, and tape can help that, uh, help you unlock your knees. And I, I mean, invariably, people with back, hip or sciatic pain whose root causes are knee locking, when I unlock their knees, usually in about three days, most of their, most people's pain is like 30 to 70% reduced just by unlocking their knees. And if that's the case, it tells you you're on the right track of, of solving a systems problem that's feeding a lot of your pain. Good. I don't, I have nothing else to add to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, next question from last one from Facebook is from Jane L. She says, all therapists seem to love long art quads and recommend them like they're the easiest thing in the world, but I can't do them. 
They're very painful for me to attempt. I am facing a total knee replacement in two months, partly because my kneecaps are worn so thin. Any help? Well, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right not to do them. If they're causing you pain, that's going to. So, OK, so uh, the long arc quad is when you sit down and you have your knee over, say, a coffee can or a pillow or something like that. And it's bent and then you just straighten the leg and then, you know, lower it back down. So it's just this little movement like this. And what it's designed to do is to help strengthen the quad muscles. Right. And however, she's got severe arthritis in her kneecap here or maybe the knee joint itself. I'm not sure. But uh, so when she does this, it causes lots of pain. Well, guess what pain does? Pain shuts down muscles. So if something is causing you pain to do it, your muscles are going to turn off because of the pain. And the whole idea of the exercise is to strengthen the quads. <laughs> so it's defeating the purpose of actually activating and strengthening your quads. So one way that I, I work with you know people is I have them uh, have both legs up on the bed and then I have them put their hands on their quad muscles and I have them contract both of their quad muscles at the same time. And so they get to feel with their normal quad, how that contracts, the speed of the contraction, the volume of the contraction, and they get to compare that to their painful side. Usually when your legs are already straight, now because the knee isn't bending and straightening, it's this is gonna be pain-free for them. So we don't have to worry about pain shutting down the quad anymore. And so now you get just get to feel how you, your painful side quad is operating versus your non-painful side. Usually it's fairly significant. Usually the painful side will lag just a little bit. The volume of contraction will be a little bit uh, less than the non-painful side. So from this position, once you feel that difference, what you can do is, you know, you could just do a simple straight leg raise instead. So that's one way to start activating the quads and get them stronger without bending the knee so much and hurting that. So the other thing to think about is that when we're doing a long arc quad, there's a lot of surface of the kneecap that's in contact with the knee. And so you 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 almost have maximal contact surface, which if it's an arthritic knee, it's going to really irritate it. An easier way to adapt this is to sit down and bend the knee completely to 90, degree, 90 degrees. And what a lot of people will find is that they're, when they bend their knee in this angle from you know, 90 to maybe 60, there's no pain or very little pain. And here we are, we're still strengthening the quadriceps, but we're now we're doing it in a pain-free way. So whatever arc you can move through uh, to strengthen that, that's pain-free, is the arc that you should get, is the arc that you should use. Even if it's five degrees, even down here, you're activating the quad and it's moving against the resistance of, the, of gravity of the lower leg. So uh, that's a second way that you can approach this to strengthen your quads. Um, and I, I, especially if your knee is that arthritic, I don't really recommend weight-bearing strengthening exercises because that's probably going to irritate things. Now, if, if you have access to a leg press machine, that also might be a nice way to strengthen your quads. And again, there might be just an arc of movement in that strengthening that feels best to you. And maybe if you get too deep or too shallow, that's going to hurt your knee more. So just feel free to just work in a small arc of movement. There's lots of studies that show that working in a smaller arc of movement translates to a larger arc of movement. So just get some strengthening and some arc. And then the last way that you can try this is if you lie on your back on the bed and you you have your leg bent at 90 degrees like this, simply just lifting your foot up and down, you wouldn't believe how fatiguing this is for the quads. Very fatiguing, even if you just move in a small motion. So uh, I would try this as another alternative to see if you can strengthen that quad pain-free. Those are all good alternatives. I will say the laying on the back kicking up one is harder than you think, especially if you have tight hamstrings. Yeah, tight hamstrings. So, you know, maybe it, so if you're doing this lying on your back and your hamstrings are tight, all right, they're going to resist you more. The higher your foot goes, the tighter the hamstrings, the more the hamstrings will come into play. So just, but also think about this, the physics of this, as the foot's going up, the weight become the, the, the work that the quad is doing is less because this is more of a gravitational force on your quad than up, than up here. Now the force is going down the thigh bone. So 
if if tight hamstrings are the problem, it's really no problem because you could just strengthen down here, and that's the maximal effort that you're going to be producing anyways through this lower range. And then and down in this range, the hamstrings shouldn't be a component of that. You have answers to everything. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen lots of problems in my career. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to switch to some of our questions from Instagram. So these names are going to be a little different. Um, so the first three we're going to ask all at once because they all have a similar answer. So Kate Joe said they have peroneal tendonitis and ankle strengthening, please. That's what they want some exercises for. The next person called Meldulicus. I have excruciating shin pain at night. Any ideas for exercise? And the third question is from Katie Margason 6 Is there any way to get rid of posterior tibialis, tibial tendonitis? Boy, these are mouthfuls. Yeah. Uh, well done with those names, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing. I'm probably butchering these. All right. So, so let's look at, let's, let's first orient to the anatomy uh, that we're talking about here. So I'm going to, I'm going to share an image first here. All right. So what I'm sharing here, th this is the front of the knee. Here's the kneecap. Here's the shin. And you'll see these are the muscles in the front of our lower leg bone. You can see there's not many of them, right? And they're fairly small. So when we have, um, shin splints, we're talking about usually a chronic overuse of these muscles acting on the shin that then causes uh, bony changes in the shin. Okay. Now I'm going to unshare that and I'm going to share the next uh, group. So here are the muscles in the back of the lower leg. Look at the difference. I mean, let's just step back and look at the sheer volume dedicated to the muscles in the back of the lower leg bone versus the front. There's more than twice as many, all right? And they're huge. So on the outside here, most superficially, we have the calf muscle and the soleus muscle. Both start above the knee. Well, the calf does. And then the, the soleus starts below the knee, but they both blend into the Achilles tendon and insert into the heel bone here. So, uh, so that's what this image is. And then here's a plantaris which I think maybe 30% of the population doesn't even have. So you may or may not have a plantaris that mimics the uh, calf muscle. All right, so in the second image over here, we have cut away the calf and soleus, and now you get to see the deeper muscles. Okay, so the first question was, I think the peroneus longus was her question. Why is that so irritated? And then the other one is the, uh, let's see, tibialis posterior tendonitis, okay? So the peroneal lo peroneus longus is coming down here on the outside of the ankle bone, right? This, this lateral ankle bone, and it goes, dips underneath the foot. The tibialis posterior comes down along here and goes to the inside of the ankle bone and comes in underneath the foot. So tendonitis in both issues, okay? And then we also have our shin splint guy. Okay, so this is the, the way the body works typically is when you have tendonitis, and, and tendonitis is almost, you never hear of a calf tendonitis. Well, you have a Achilles tendonitis, but you never hear of a calf tendonitis or a butt muscle tendonitis or, you know, latissimus dorsi tendonitis. You don't hear about those things because these are all really massive muscles and their job, they have multiple jobs to do with, with what they're doing. And typically they're designed to have these broad insertions and be your big power movers. Well, that's exactly what the calf and soleus are, are supposed to do. And so the smaller muscles, their job is to support the bigger players. So in, inevitably, wherever you are in the body, when you have tendonitis issues in these smaller muscles, it's because they're overworking, right? So regardless of whether it's peroneus, you know, in physical therapy, we love to identify the exact muscle that's being, that's tender. Okay, well, whatever, it's still a, a, a small muscle, right, that is overworking. That's what itis is, is an inflammation usually due to overworking. So why is it overworking? Because usually the big players aren't doing their job. Okay, so what are the big players in this system? Well, the calf and soleus are clearly a big player, 
But also, you wouldn't believe it, the butt muscles way up in the hip area are also a big player in this system too. But let's just stay locally here. So uh, why wouldn't the calf and soleus be working? So here we are with the lower leg bone. So when the calf and so why wouldn't the calf and soleus be working? Well, often it's due to uh, one of the issues is shoe wear. So when we wear shoes that are really puffy, right, have super cushion, and that usually have a high heel, so the, the toe is sitting slightly below the heel, and, uh, and then we have a foot strike pattern that is a heel strike pattern, the calf muscle has no reason to turn on. And uh, I'm sorry, the calf muscle back here has no reason to turn on. And so it becomes weak and underused. So a heel strike pattern will turn off the calf muscle and the soleus. And therefore, any use that, that is you know, called upon by these muscles, it will fall to the deeper, smaller, tinier muscles instead. So uh, that's one of the reasons why these deeper ones become more irritated and develop tendonitis. And that's why the calf muscle gets turned off. Now, the other cause, and it can happen concurrently, is that the calf muscle is actually, and soleus muscles are tight. And so when you are walking, your knee is supposed to travel over the foot at foot strike. All right. Now, if you have tight calf and soleus muscles, that restricts the ability of that knee to move forward. So instead of it going like this, it may just be going to here, all right? Well, if you've ever uh, not seen something and run into it like a table or doorway, you'll recognize that even just taking half of a step, our bodies generate tremendous forces when we are moving forward. It's like when you run into something that you didn't see that's you know fixed, it's like getting hit by an NFL linebacker. I mean, it's tremendous force that, that you're hitting and, and your body is generating. So all that force is trying to move forward, but now your calf and soleus tightness is restricting that. Where does that force go? Because you've got to move forward. Well, it can go one of two places. One is it can be driven down into the foot and then stress all the foot tissues, or two, it'll go back up to the knee, all right? And so when the calf and soleus is so tight, this is this uh, also lends another. So uh, both that peroneus and the posterior tibialis, if you saw it, they remember they went underneath the foot. That's because they control foot pronation and supination, the flattening and arching of your foot. So when you have all this excessive force being driven down into the foot, it's causing those little tendons to have to work harder because there's too much force being driven down. And now all these little tiny tendons and things and foot muscles have to work a lot harder to offset this tremendous force. Okay. Why would the calf and soleus become tight? Because of usually how we sleep. And so how we sleep, and this is going to get into the shin splints question too. How we sleep is usually our foot is pointed away from us like this. If we sleep on our back, the covers lie on top and they push our toes away. If we sleep on the side, our toes usually point down like this. And if we sleep on our stomach, then the bed is pushing the foot away. So that's 68 hours of calf and soleus shortening every night, all right, which then causes them to, to be weak. Now, if your calf and soleus uh, are tight, what opposes the calf and soleus muscles? These front of these muscles here in the shin. So this is often why uh, anti, uh, shin splints are occurring is because there's these muscles are having to work too hard against an excessively tight calf and soleus. All right. So how do we solve this? Well, there's something that I recommend in my foot pain program called a dorsal night splint. And so what that does is it holds the foot in a neutral position when you're sleeping. And therefore, it doesn't the calf and soleus muscles don't get to shorten anymore. So when the muscle when the foot is like this, these shin muscles are trying to pull the foot up for you. But the calf and soleus, you saw the size of them. They're massive. They're so tight. These guys will never win. So you need something else to help pull those toes up. And that's where the shin splint comes in. And then it will not only calm the, uh, um, the shin muscles down, but it will naturally lengthen the calf and soleus muscles too. And when the calf and soleus muscles get to lengthen and you can, your knee can pass further over the foot of foot strike, then the foot 
muscles and tendons on the bottom of the foot don't have to work so hard against all of this excessive force because it's being dispersed throughout the whole foot and ankle system and knee and lower body system the way it should. And so all that posterior tendonitis, posterior tibial tendonitis, and the peroneus tendonitis will start to calm down too. Now, uh, so ultimately, when you're in this acute stage of all this tendonitis, you can't make huge changes to your footwear because it'll just be too much. So I would recommend starting with the, the, uh, the dorsal night splint first. But I've also developed a taping technique uh, to correct these excessive forces that are traveling down through the foot and irritating all of these tissues. And it uses one piece of tape, but it controls both the foot arch and the ankle, and it does so precisely. So that uh, while you're in the process of fixing all of this tightness, weakness, and so forth, everything being shut off, the tape will protect these structures for you, and it'll start calming down all this tendonitis uh, stuff that's going on. All right, long, long answer for several problems, but hopefully that answers the question. I will say the uh, for our listeners, I am currently wearing a night splint like Rick talked about. And they take a little while to get acclimated to and build up your time with. But I have forgotten to wear it a few times. And I wake up and my ankle is way more stiff in the morning. So yeah. it's, it's definitely worth it if you have uh, some type of ankle issues. Yeah. So so why would that be difficult? Why would we have to build up to something to wear something that's only going to hold our foot into a neutral position? The, the answer is, is that it's not just, your foot isn't just falling in this position. Most people with these chronic problems are actually contracting their calf and soleus at night, pulling the foot down into this position. All right. And so uh, that is what's driving this behavior. And so the dorsal night splint will, because now you're going to be uh, contracting those, that calf and soleus against a fixed object that isn't allowing it to, to do what the calf and soleus has been getting away with for years. And so it's like pushing a, a it's like pushing a bench press and just holding it there all day long because you're just working, 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 even though nothing's moving, you're working against that that weight all the time. And that's what the dorsal night splint is against the chronically contracted calf and soleus muscles. But this is a behavior. So you have learned to do this and you have to unlearn to do this. So this is why it takes a while to be able to wear the dorsal night splint throughout the night is because we have to fix the contraction pattern that your brain has created around this system. And so most people, what I recommend doing is wearing the dorsal night splint the second half of the night. If you get up to go pee, put on the uh, dorsal night splint on the second half of the night, and then you'll wake up with the benefits of its lengthening right in the morning. If you just wear it the first half of the night, the night, well, the second half, you'll go back to shortening it again, and you won't wake up the, with the benefits. Right. Yeah, that's what I started doing, and then I have progressed to wearing it when I go to bed. But sometimes I wake up, and it's like six hours later, and my calf's a little tight, so I take it off because I want to go back to bed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'm exactly. progressing. And if you yeah. want to know what it feels like for people, and you don't want to order one right away, if you kind of put your foot on, you know, the end of the couch, if you have an armrest there, just put your foot flat up against that. And it pretty much just keeps it in that position, essentially. Yeah. And, and it's important to, to also mention that the, the goal of the dorsal night splint is not to stretch the calf and soleus. We don't want it to be maximum because you can adjust these things. Yeah. We don't want it to be maximally stretched. That's going to be unbearably painful for you because it's your calf and soleus are used to being here. All we need to do is some improvement. So you can come up a little bit like this when you get started. You can come up to a neutral, but never bring it all the way up. That's just way too much of aggressive of a change all at once. And you'll you'll be very angry with me <laughs> if you try to do something like that. Remember, all we need is all we need to do is stop this behavior. This is an improvement on this. Yeah. And they I mean, I can crank on it pretty tight and it it can get uncomfortable at first, but they do have limitations. Like they don't really bring my ankle real far up. Um, but it depends yeah, on the kind that you get. Some of them allow that. Yeah. yeah. I think I got the one you recommended in your yeah. uh, program, but mm -hmm. all right. Next question is from Trish MD from Instagram. 
So oh, just uh, I, I, this is, I wanted to go back. I, there was one thing I missed. Sure. Okay. So um, uh, strengthening, strengthening the calf and soleus. Let's say your calf and soleus has become weak. Like my calf and soleus muscles are very weak because uh, a, as a runner, I'm a, a strong heel striker. Okay. And so uh, I'm trying to run better, which involves me changing my form where I can't change my form to a more of a foot, foot, uh, four foot strike because my calf and soleus muscles are so weak. So I've, I just want to give this little plug to this book called The Cool Impossible, written by Eric Orton. And he is an ultra runner uh, trainer or coach. And he has some great exercises in this book for training the calf and soleus muscles. I, I, I just want to show you one real quick here, Mike. It, it's just brilliant stuff. And I've never understood how I should go about doing this. And he kind of lays it out in this book. But basically, you know, we create this little block here. And so when it's lying on the floor, it's at an angle. And that's about a 10 degree angle. I measured it out of the block that's in his book. And so I, I made one. All I did was I, I just, you know, glued and, and drilled a couple, a little like, you know, one inch board onto the bottom of another board. And you want a little small square like this. So what we do is we put it on the ground. And so it's at this angle. And so I'm going to just show you, you're supposed to do this in your bare feet. But here it is, it's on the ground. So if I step on this with my forefoot on the right foot, my right toe is higher than, than the pinky toes. And I bring the heel up just slightly above the platform here. And you can use poles here and eventually you can progress to no poles, but I, I need two poles right now. And so you just stand, you lock your knee and you, you lift up the heel a little bit. And what that's gonna do is start to strengthen your calf and soleus muscles to accommodate the, the demands that you need. And so if I do it with my left foot, now my left toe is lower than my pinky toe. And so you also do it like this, and then you would turn around and do the right. So the, now the right toe is lower, and then the left, so the left toe is higher. And then finally you face it so that you're facing an incline and you lift up that, that heel like this. Uh, you wouldn't, and you, you know, your goal is to hold that for about, oh, uh, maybe two minutes and do two or three sets of that. You wouldn't believe how, <laughs> I can't believe how difficult that is for me because my calves are just so weak. Uh, and then I found out that my right calf is weaker than my left through doing this. So this is a great way to train that system. If you're a runner and you're like me and a heel strike runner, uh, and I've always known it was bad, but every time I've tried to switch to a four foot strike, I just shred my calf and sole and my calf and soleus muscles and talk about posterior tibial tendonitis and peroneal tendonitis. Oh my God, I would have to quit running for months. So now I finally have a training program to train up to being able to run like that. And so those of you whose pain is due to weakness, this is a way to discover whether it's how it, if it's weak, and if there's asymmetries between the two legs and how to solve it. It's a great, great exercise. So you just, you just do static holds? Is that what you said? Yeah, you just do static holds. Oh. And then there's another one that he recommends. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, for and people that another, could... Sorry. <laughs> For people that could see when it, his foot is one way, it's going to be kind of angled like this. Exactly. Like this. this is my so. big toe. It's up. And sometimes that big toe is down. And then the other one, I'm just, you know, but always my heel is above the, the, the forefoot slightly. It doesn't have to be, you know, maximally. And then uh, the other block that he has, and I haven't made yet because I haven't, I'm not that advanced, but you have the same size block. And then you put a little half circle on the bottom of it, which creates a, a wobbly block. And so then you progress from strengthening to strengthening while stabilizing too. Yeah. Uh, we have challenging, crazy. There's a board, uh, that they actually make like that. Um, we had some other guests on that talked about, it. I can link it down below if people are curious, but it's like a wobble board, but it has holes cut out for the toes and then your toes go in there and your big toe stays up. Yeah, I, I suppose that would work, but I'll, I'll tell you, all of my toes are gripping that board without those holes. <laughs> yeah i and, mean i'm and, just saying for you the, know it doesn't have to be fancy i guess is what i'm saying it can yeah. be a simple block yeah. with a little piece of wood on the bottom of it and i don't have a little semi-circle piece of wood so i'm just going to cut a little square and sand off the edges to make it more round sure. and then screw that on the bottom of another one so uh, that'll work anyway it's it's really changing my world uh because I, you know i'd love to get into ultra running 
but my my calves are so weak. So if we look at, go back to that architecture of that picture I showed you, the calf and soleus muscle are massive, right? And I'm not using them at all when I'm running. And most people aren't using them at all when they're walking, especially if they're heel strikers. And a lot of people are heel strikers because they wear shoes with thick heels on them, which allows them to get away with this abnormal faulty gait pattern. That turns off the calf and soleus muscles. So while you're transitioning to this, you may have to do some calf and soleus strengthening. And then as your pain goes away and you want more of a longer term solution, you create a zero last shoe, which is a, a shoe that you can just go straight across instead of the heel being higher and minimal, minimal um, cushion. So then your foot is interacting with the ground and, and, and floor more, and that will train all of these muscles to work as they should. Right. And then you typically, you have to walk slower and take shorter steps. I have, initially, I have flat and more minimal shoes and running was fine to transition. But walking, I have noticed I still heel strike even in my minimal shoes. And I think that's causing some of my problems. So your suggestion of um, trying to take shorter steps and initially walking more on your toes has helped me with that. Good, good. So, yeah, that's kind of a I don't know why running transitioning was easy. Walking has just been. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to guess that you're a four foot runner naturally. And I, I used to be more heel strike and I started working out a long time ago, but I didn't switch my shoes. And then uh, now I switched, but I, my running shoes have, they're flat, but they're more cushioned. They're not like minimalist. So. Right. Right. But I don't know. It just wasn't hard for me to, I, I started, I should say I started wearing flat or minimalist shoes first, just walking and then did that for months and then went running. Cause that's kind of what they suggested in the, book above me to do so yeah but. yeah I, I i made the mistake i was training for a marathon i was at the 18 mile mark right and i, I read born to run and i thought oh minimal shoe that's where it's at okay so i bought a pair of canvas converse shoes because you can't get more minimalist than converse shoes really you know and so i run out and ran you know 18 miles in my and I couldn't run for like six months. It had completely <laughs> shredded everything in my lower body. And you'd think being a physical therapist, I would be smarter than that. But no, you know, I wanted instant changes right now. I had no idea that my calves were that weak. Yeah, if you, uh, I've done that with like the finger toe shoes once. And I yeah. ran on concrete and I was, yeah, it was fine running. The, the next week was terrible. So oh, yeah, transition oh, slowly. Awful. Uh, our next question comes from Cleo Sweet of Instagram. What is the one best exercise for bone on bone knee arthritis that I should do? Well, uh, this is a, a good question. So one of the things that, so there's a lot of pain, um, surrounding knee arthritis. Okay. And I'm sure Cleo, you're doing stretching. And if you're not, then you should be lengthening the calf muscles. And that dorsal night splint could help with that, that we just talked about. Lengthen the hamstring muscles and that single leg hamstring stretch that I like to do with your other foot on the ground is a great way to do that. And that lets you see unilaterally whether one leg is tighter. And then finally, that thigh stretch that I went over at the very beginning of, of this stretch uh, of this talk uh, is a great way to do it because that uh, isolates the thigh muscles. So let's say that you've got all that stretching under control. Um, you know, often there's a, a weakness component to this. And one of the muscles that's often turned on, it's a, it's my favorite culprit is the butt muscles. And that's usually because we lock the knees when we walk, turns off the butt muscles. Well, the butt muscle controls half of, half of your knee joint. It's controlling the thigh bone. So if the butt muscle isn't turned on when you're walking and therefore your thigh bone is uncontrolled, well, this plays out at the knee joint and can cause excessive wear and tear. So doing the butt, punch, butt, butt pump strengthening that I have in my program, learning how to walk correctly by unlocking your knees, taking smaller steps, steps like Mike was saying initially to get the butt to turn on is, is how you're going to start controlling that thigh bone. All right. So uh, let's say you've got all of that under control. Um, so the last thing I would talk about is that there is a little muscle behind the knee called the popliteus muscle. And it starts on the inside of the knee here it, where it's thick. That's where the most of the muscle belly is. And then it becomes a thin tendon as it comes up here to the outside of the knee. This is the back of the knee, by the way. 
And so it's, it kind of runs like this. All right. Now, what I have found with people with uh, a lot of knee pain, what happens is, is that popliteus muscle gets, becomes in spasm. And so what it does, because you can imagine that because it's crossing the knee joint and it's going from the inside to the outside, it helps control knee rotation. What little knee rotation we have is controlled by this tiny little guy. So uh, getting someone to massage that muscle for you can often eliminate significant amounts of knee pain. I don't care how bad your arthritis is. I, I had a girl come in who had a, an acute tibial plateau. She fractured the top of her lower leg bone here. She came in three days later and said, my knee is just killing me. Can you help me? I'm thinking, I don't know. So I massaged the back of her knee, the popliteus muscle. She walked out 100% pain-free. Why? Because when the popliteus is in spasm, it's locking the knee into a rotated position and making it wear weight bear in a way it doesn't like weight bearing. And so it's like uh, if you were going to take a rag a wet rag and wring it out. As you're wringing it out, your two hands are coming close to, closer together because as you twist that, the distance between the hands lessens. And that's what's happening to the knee joint. Everything is compressed and rotated and it doesn't like that. So by massaging the, the popliteus muscle, it unwinds this and there gets to be space in between the two parts of the knee. So that's how I would uh, target your, your issues for you. I realize we skipped a question. <laughs> uh, so I'll go back to the Trish MD question from Instagram. Uh, just diagnosed with mild arthritis in lower back and hip on the right side, having trouble bending their knee while walking. Any exercises I can do at home? Okay, well, uh, so arthritis, what was that, Mike? Arthritis and what? Arthritis in the lower back and hip and then having trouble bending knee when walking. Okay, so I'm assuming it's all on the same side. Right side. Yeah, okay, all, all on the right side. So uh, here's the skeleton's right side. So uh, Trish MD, likely you have one side of your pelvis that's higher and one side of the rib cage that's lower. And it could be that you have unilateral arthritis in your spine. And if you do, it's likely on the side that you have the hip pain and uh, what other, whatever other pain that you have, or knee pain, I think it was, in your leg. Why is this happening, all right? Your brain is trying to lift up that pelvis because something is wrong here. So what I would first recommend is that you see, have someone take a picture of your back and see if, if there's a larger crease on this side than the other side, it's confirming that you have a side bending problem, all right? And that your whole body is adapting to a, some smaller problem in this leg. Okay, so we, I, I, you know, I, I know I sound like a broken record, but most hip issues are due to poor gluteal function. And so the butt pumps that I talk about and fixing your gait pattern are the way to solve this because most people's gait patterns are with a locked knee and a strong heel strike and the butt foot is way out in front of them when they strike. That turns off everything through this whole chain. So what you've got to learn to do is when you're reaching that leg to go forward, your body's coming forward with that leg and the other leg is left behind. So your body should be over this advancing leg when it strikes on the ground and the knee should be soft when that happens. And <clears throat> an easy way to do this is to simply just walk on your tippy toes for like 10 or 20 steps and you'll, it'll force your body to be aligned over your foot at foot strike and it will force the butt muscle to turn on naturally. And what I would be curious to see is if you're having hip pain or that back pain or that knee pain and you walk on tippy toes, I wonder if all of that disappears. And if it does, it's telling you that you have primarily a gait problem at the root of a lot of your issues. And if you solve the gait problem and get the muscles to turn on the way they're supposed to, it will, um, it will uh, not dissolve your pain, but it will disperse the forces acting through your joints, and your problem joints. And uh, it should solve your pain in that way. Uh, also, if you walk tippy toe, what I would do, since everything's on your right side, and I'm going to suspect that you have a right side bending problem, if you do this with your right arm overhead, it's also going to solve the side bending problem as well. Uh, this may be unrelated, but is so you know Ben Patrick, knees over toes guy, right? Yeah. 
and he talks about walking backwards. Mm-hmm. Would that be a beneficial way to try to increase your strength and mobility in your posterior chain? Well, uh, well, yeah, of course it will engage the posterior chain more, but at some point you have to walk forward. Yeah, so, <laughs> I, I realize that part. But... <laughs> so, I mean, walk backwards all you want, but if you don't use those lessons to walk forward, it's not teaching you how to walk forward. Sure. So I, I agree with that as a way to turn on those muscles. But if you remember when we talked about those super highways of fascia mm-hmm. that run through the body from head to toe, there's a big one that runs along the whole backside. And walking backwards will engage that whole fascial superhighway even more. So while that may solve uh, an, a knee pain or maybe a hip pain issue, it may not solve, it, it may aggravate something like a sciatic or SI joint or back issue because it's it's reproducing the pattern that's engaging this whole fascial line of tension in the first place. Sure. Okay. Just curious. Yeah. I have right. nothing against it, though. I mean, it's a great way to turn things on, but it's not functional. Um, yeah. Ultimately. All right. On to the YouTube questions. I have extremely tight hips. I have done yoga for almost three years now with very little improvement, as well as the last year or so, I have developed pain in my hip while sleeping on my side. I have tried sleeping with pillow between my knees with no success. I don't think mid fifties should be so stiff and painful. Any suggestions? Yeah. So let's take the easy way out of this one first. When you're sleeping on your side, um, there's, there's uh, a couple ways that you can put your pillows and I, I don't have my little foam piece of foam with me, but let's say you're asleep on your side. So what are the widest parts of your body when you're asleep on your side? Well, the shoulder and the hip joints. And so your hip is already painful and now you're lying on it and it makes it even more painful. So an easy way to solve the sleeping, uh, instead of putting pillows between your knees, put a, put a bed pillow underneath your rib cage. And what that will do is it will unload both the shoulder and the hip joint. And you should be able to sleep through the night really nicely like that because now you've taken significant weight off of those two joints. The other thing is I would recommend is when you sleep on your side and your knees are bent, put a pillow underneath the bottom ankle. What would that do? Well, what it's going to do, I'm going to just move this up. If we have a pillow underneath the bottom ankle like this, what it's going to do is it's going to rotate the knee to the outside. And an externally rotated joint is a freer joint in most cases. So putting the pillow underneath the ankle will open up the hip joint so it's not as, because likely it's being compressed in an internally rotated position. The the body doesn't, especially the hip joint, the shoulder joint and the knee joints don't like internal rotation. So this pillow will help hold everything in an externally rotated position, which will help, uh, should help significantly. And then in addition to the pillow underneath your rib cage should completely unload this hip pain issue for you. So let's go back to the first part of that question though. Uh, she's been trying yoga for years. It's not helping. You know, her hips are incredibly tight. Well, this goes back to thinking of this pain as it, your brain registers this this as a tight hip. But really, what if it's a contracted hip and not a tight hip? A contraction pattern. Uh, so tension in the body is often misunderstood as tightness. Tension is actually due to contracted muscles. Why would muscles be contracted in this area? Well, I've kind of gone over this in earlier talks that when the butt muscle doesn't work well, the muscles deep to it have to work extra hard to hold on to things. These are the muscles that are usually tense and, and we try to stretch them all the time, but they're, but they get, just get tense again. And often it's because of a usage pattern that's turning off the big muscle that's supposed to be doing most of the job. What is that usage pattern? Locking the knees when you're walking with a strong heel strike and your body's behind your foot at foot strike, which turns off all of the key big muscles and makes the little ones work harder. So making this slight change will probably help that dynamic in your hip. Uh, Likely, and if this is happening, likely you have what I call that anterior femoral glide syndrome where the thigh bone is likely migrating forward in the hip socket uh, because the butt muscle isn't turning on to control that pivot point. And so that's also causing these smaller muscles then to hold on even harder because they're trying to control this whole system here. It's not their job to control the system. 
they're supporting actors. They're not the lead actor. The butt is the lead actor here. And so uh, these little supporting guys can't do the job like the big guy can. All right, so that's probably what's at the root of this whole problem for you. The last thing I wanna talk about tension is that if this is a contraction pattern, how do you eliminate chronic tension? Well, in our bodies, we have something called a stretch reflex, which means, and, and you've all experienced this when you've gone to the doctor or the PT, and they get out that little hammer and, and they tap your little patella tendon here and your foot jerks up, right? They're testing your reflexes. So it's not only in the, in the knee joint that we have these, the stretch reflex. We have it in all of our muscles. All of our muscles have a length tension relationship that they have uh, been uh, trained to have. And so uh, if we try to stretch a muscle that your brain has been trained to be a certain tone or a certain length, your brain will then, what you'll run into is a stretch, stretch reflex pattern where you stretch it, it triggers this automated stretch reflex and it comes back again to their original tightness. I get question after question about this all the time. So how do we stop this, this cycle from happening? Well, there's a, a unique and I think very powerful um, uh, uh, technique I learned called HANA somatics which, you know, the way to, un, to break this stretch reflex pattern is you have to get your brain involved because there's a certain uh, neural pathway that your brain is using called the cortical spinal tract, which when engaged can help you unravel the stretch reflex pattern, okay? It helps uh, it reset the length tension relationship that you're trying to achieve. And so I've developed a uh, my somatic audio lessons, there's eight of them and I, and they're for free. You just pay shipping and handling, uh, that will do this. I found that these, these stretch reflex patterns or these, these, this muscle tension pattern is happening along typically these fascial superhighways of, of tension that we have throughout our, our body. And so these audio lessons address these larger patterns of tension in the body that are causing uh, local pain. And so I would probably recommend that if you feel like you're fighting tension and tightness, it's, or, or tightness, it's probably a tension issue. And likely you need to teach your brain how to release the tension as well as fix the, me the mechanics that are causing that tension in the first place to really uh, resolve this completely. How long are the audio lessons? Each audio lesson is about 30 minutes long. Are they different? areas of the body or yes okay. so uh there are eight of them uh one targets this back line of fascia or movement one targets the side line and including the side bending pattern one targets the spiral issues uh one targets the front line of the body another one just deals with the hips and knees another one deals with the neck and shoulders another one deals with breathing and the last one deals with walking and I typically recommend that people uh, work through all eight of those. Uh, one, you know, like day one, you would start with lesson one twice a day. Day two, you do lesson two twice a day. And you work through all eight of those lessons to see which one has the, the gold nuggets that are good for you. And then want, you continue doing that while you continue with your rehab program. I just want to randomly try this to see what it's like. It's hugely powerful, Mike. Uh, most chronic pain has a tension aspect to that pain pattern. And, and I, this is one of the things I've discovered. Thomas Myers discovered all of these fascial superhighways, but then Thomas Hanna, who developed the Hanna semantics technique I was just talking about, also found that we have neurologically te ten neurological tension pathways that absolutely, and he didn't, Thomas Myers wasn't even al alive when Thomas Hanna discovered this. So, they, they both match up perfectly together with Dr. Shirley Sarman's biomechanical patterns of dysfunction. All three of these are pointing to the same things. And so that's how I was able to put all this together. And then I, what I did is I just put together the habits that we're, we have that are causing these patterns to occur in our body in the first place. Hmm. Yeah. So by all means, they're free. You just pay shipping and handling. You'll be mailed a USB stick. But you'll also have instant access to those somatic lessons um, 
when you buy them, you'll, you'll be able to access them immediately. You don't have to wait for the USB stick. A lot of people like the USB stick though, too. And I think you have access to my practitioner training program, right, Mike? Uh, I don't, I would have to use Bob's stuff. Oh, okay. I thought you got that too. Um, anyway, I think that's module number 10 is the somatics. Okay. Yeah. I had, I had to get a lot of continuing ed done really fast and I would rather sit down with yours. <laughs> so I'm, yeah. uh, I just did some other ones this year, but for next cycle. Yeah. In most States you get 30 CEUs for that course for physical therapists. However, uh, Minnesota just is not getting back to me. So I don't know what's going on with Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on. Put in a word for me, would you? Yeah, that's where my license is. Yeah, um, exactly. All right. Next question. We're going to combine two again because your answer is kind of similar for both. So from YouTube, SG says, I am a keen runner and do supinate when I run. I have had recurrent inner knee pain near my gracilis muscle, preceded by tenderness in the area before medial knee pain occurs almost at the joint bony area where the knee bends. What is the best approach to dealing with this? I have tried to focus my much of my strength, much of my regular strength work on my hips, my glutes, but so far I'm not finding this to help out with these issues. Is there something more effective I could be doing? And the next question, which is similar, is... Nicholas B, I have runner's knee. The swelling comes and goes. Help me understand the pathophysiology and how can I rehab best, please? Yeah, so my, let's go to the first guy's question. So there may be a red herring in there. So he first mentioned supination. Supination means that the arch of the, of the foot is high. Okay, uh, was this a guy that... It, that it, it says SG. I didn't. SG. I haven't okay. seen their pictures. I don't know. All right. So, uh, all right. So, first of all, we don't know their running style. Are they a forefoot striker? Are they heel striker? A midfoot striker? Supination with any of these strike patterns has different ramifications. So, when you're a forefoot striker, when you're running, you're naturally going to land in a supinated position, and then you roll to into the big toe. So, this is a normal pattern for forefoot runners. So I'm not sure if that may or may not even be an issue for you. If you're a heel striker and you're supinating, then that may be more of an issue because what that's doing is locking. When you strike with a supinated foot, you tend to lock the whole system up. All right. So uh, so one of the things that causes people to supinate. So supination is kind of a rare natural issue. Really, it's often a behavioral response to something going on in our bodies. So our, our, our thigh bones here uh, are not all shaped the same. And some thigh bones are rotated out, in which case that's called femoral retroversion. And some thigh bones are rotated in, and that's called femoral antiversion. Men typically tend towards the femoral retroversion or external rotation of the thigh bone. And females tend to uh, orient to antiversion or internal rotation of the thigh bones. So if this is a, uh, the consequence of this is that if your thigh bone is rotated out and you believe that you should be standing with your foot pointed forward, then you're going to likely develop a high arch. Why? Or a supinated arch. Why? Because your body is your body. This is, you can't change the shape of your thigh bone. So your body is trying to rotate the thigh bone out. You're forcing it to be in by pointing your foot forward. But those forces that the thigh bone are generating have to go somewhere. So what they do is they gradually travel spirally through the leg and cause the arch of the foot to raise in what appears to be a supinated foot. Most, almost all supinated feet I've looked at, though, have a retroversion where the person is trying to stand with their foot forward. When I get them to rotate their foot out slightly to accommodate the rotation of their thigh bone, then the arch starts to melt back down to the ground and they suddenly have a more natural arch. So your supination may be due to the fact that you have retroverted femurs and you're standing and running, trying to walk, trying to stand and run with your toe pointed forward, which is artificially causing a supinated foot. That would be my suspicion. All right. So, uh, and then where, where, Mike, can you, where was the pain that they were, so that addresses the supination. 
aspect of things. So what was the what was their pain in that first question, Mike? Near my gracilis muscle. Okay. So the gracilis muscle. All right. So the gracilis muscle is one that runs along the inside of the thigh and attaches into the lower leg bone. So why might that gracilis muscle first, you know, be irritated? Well, first of all, why is it one leg and not both legs? And is it one foot that's supinated and not both feet supinated? So this leads me to think that there is a strength imbalance between your two legs. If, it, if one problem is happening in one leg versus the other, 90, 80 to 90 percent of the cases where that gracilis is painful is is the weaker leg. All right. However, um, 10 to 20 percent of the cases, this leg is compensating for the other leg that's weak. Here's a quick and easy way to figure this out. Sit in a chair, lift up one of your feet stand up and sit down and then do that with your other foot on the ground instead. And you should notice probably a significant difference between the two legs. If it's the same leg that you're having pain in, then that leg is the weaker one. However, if the other leg is the weaker one, then that's telling you that you're likely compensating for some problems in that other leg during your running instead. Okay, so let's go back to this idea. This person has supinated feet and he has inner thigh tension. Uh, and the gracilis. It doesn't matter which of the in, in, inner thigh muscles he, he has pain in it because they're all, you know, they all basically do the same thing. So, uh, so why, why would this develop? Well, if we go back to the idea that he has a uh, retroverted femur and he turns his foot or she turns their foot in p- facing forward, what muscles are they using to turn their foot inward? They're using their inner thigh muscles. So the more that they keep trying to turn their foot in, the more activated these inner thigh muscles become, and then you're running on them, and now you've developed a tendonitis issue on on any of these inner thigh muscles. Frankly, uh, one of those inner thigh muscles attaches right next to one of the hamstring muscles. And so a lot of people mistake a hamstring chronic strain when it's actually an inner thigh chronic strain. And the inner thigh chronic strain is occurring often because of this orientation of how they're orienting the lower leg in relationship to the shape of the thigh bone. So that's probably, if you just start turning your feet out, see if that gracilis pain goes away. If it does, it's likely further evidence that you are trying to excessively internally rotate that leg because you've got a retroverted femur. That's not easy to do. I'm trying to do that. (laughs) Do what? (laughs) let my toes go out because my toes are naturally yeah. retroverted and they don't want to, when I run because I'm kind of mid or four front forefoot, it, they kind of want to just go straight when I land. You're absolutely right. If you're a four foot runner, that's what happens. If you're not a four foot runner, then likely, and, and you're right, running is more difficult to, to turn the feet slightly outward than it is walking. So, however, we walk more, much more often than we run. So if you fix your gait pattern of walking, this will usually solve your running problems because it, your walking will have calmed down the muscles that are already irritated when you begin your running, uh, your running bout. So if you fix the issues walking, you won't have to worry so much about the running issues anymore. Those will melt away. Sure. Uh, so when that comes, so that would pertain to runner's knee as well, fixing those type of issues? Absolutely. Uh, runner's knee, uh, again, what I would, again, you could be compensating for weakness on the other side. So first test I would do, and I do this with all the runners uh, during my initial exam, I have them do a single leg stand and sit down on one leg versus the other. And then uh, if it's the same leg, then I know that that's the leg I should be focusing on. If it's the opposite leg, then I say, I think we've got a compensation pattern going on here. And so we dig deeper into that, what, where that weakness is. Sure. So. And, and again, the, the runner's knee, uh, you know, gosh, there's so much that could be causing runner's knee because if, think about the knee, then there's precious little in the knee that actually controls the knee. Uh, there's only that little tiny little popliteus muscle in the, that runs in the back. Everything else is coming down from the hip or coming up from the foot and ankle. So uh, really most runner's knee is due to some problem at the hip or the foot or both. And, uh, so, you know, that's how, 
you would generally think about it. Now, if you want to, you can try that little popliteus uh, massage that I mentioned earlier. The popliteus runs uh, across the back of the knee joint like this from the lower inner knee to the upper thigh bone on the outside. Massaging that will untwist the knee and therefore allow it to move more freely. That alone might solve your runner's knee issue. If the popliteus solves it, well, you have to address then why the popliteus is, is so irritated. Usually it's because you're locking the knee all day long when you're standing and walking. So you got to stop that behavior. Um, the other component, uh, and this is surprisingly, a, a lot of practitioners don't understand the concept of retroversion and antiversion in terms of the thigh bone. And so you could have a retroverted or antiverted thigh bone that's causing that your, your muscles aren't supporting correctly, which is causing stress at the knee because either the, the bone is excessively inwardly rotated and your butt isn't strong enough to control that internal rotation to decelerate it. Or you've got an externally rotated and your foot isn't in the right place and or oriented in the right direction. And then that's causing torque at the knee too. But there's usually precious little at the knee that's causing knee pain. It's usually coming from a hip or a foot or both. Okay. Next question is from Aruna Chuby. <laughs> I'm guessing is how to say that. They have knee pain while climbing stairs only on the left knee. Okay, so uh, let's go back to that uh, first uh, chair exercise. First, find out whether that in the leg is a weaker leg than the other leg, all right? And, and then that'll help guide you as to where you should be focusing. So what is going on with knee pain going up a stair? Well, most people go up a stair and they put their foot up on the stair and they go straight up like that. So what that's doing though is uh, if their butt has not been turned on during the day, you know, standing, walking, all that kind of stuff, then uh, it's not going to turn on when you're going up the stairs. And remember, the butt controls the rotation of the thigh bone, which is half of your knee. So what I, I simply recommend people do is that when they're going up a stair, they lean into the stair and go up at a diagonal instead of going straight up a stair like that. So that would be my first recommendation is to get the butt to turn on better, lean into it, and lunge into that stair going up rather than going straight up and see if that solves any of your knee pain. Now, the, the other component of this could be that, you know, your calf and soleus complex have gotten tight. And so when your knee, when your foot is stepping on that stair, the knee isn't able to lunge forward because of the tightness that you have here. So, uh, stre you know, this is where the idea of test retest comes in. So go up a stair or two, find your knee pain, get off the stairs, stretch your calf and soleus muscle, go back and do the stair again and see if that solves your pain. If it does, you know this is coming from a, the idea of a tight calf and soleus muscle for which that dorsal night splint I talked about would help you. And probably the taping of the arch of your foot uh, that's in my foot pain program too. If it doesn't, then do a set of butt pumps uh, on, to strengthen your, your glutes and then go up the stair again and see if that solves it. If, you're, if getting your butt turned on and activated better solves your knee pain, then that's where you should be focusing. So sometimes it can be really simple like that. So the last thing that I would mention about this is that, you know, starting at the pelvic bone here at the front of the pelvis, uh, going all the way and then ending at the bottom of, of the, at the other side of the, the lower leg bone, we have these thigh muscles and these often become very tight. And so uh, if those are also too tight, they will cause the knee to track poorly as well. So at the beginning of this whole question and answer session, I recommended a, uh, a stretch and I'll, I'll just pull it up here again so people know what I'm talking about here. Okay, so this, this stretch is my favorite thigh bone stretch or uh, thigh muscle stretch. And most people I start with level two, but if you're in a lot of pain and so forth, I would have you start with level one. And so basically you start with both knees to your chest, you hold onto one knee, lower the other one down, and what this does is it stretches the thigh muscle across two joints. But really what's important about this is that it's controlling your back and your pelvis so you don't hurt yourself while you're doing it. Typically, this knee will start to migrate forward. And because this is so tight, it's pulling everything forward, including your pelvis. So you want to pull that knee back to offset that. And you'll feel a nice stretch here. Again, if you do this stretch and then you go up the stairs again and you find that you're uh, knee pain is diminished, then that means that it's really coming from a thigh 
muscle tightness. So um, um, that's that one. I would like to say the first stretch is easy and the second stretch is hard. <laughs> Absolutely. It looks Absolutely. easy and it's not. Yeah. <laughs> I keep getting a uh, hamstring cramping when I'm doing it. And do you know why that's happening, Mike? Yeah. You told me my hip flexors are tight. So yeah. It's fighting against them. Yeah, exactly. So your hamstring, so muscle cramping occurs when a muscle is being asked to contract against something that's tight. It's being asked to work too hard. So you put that muscle in a shortened position and then you ask it to contract. That's a recipe for ha- for cramping of any muscle. So one of the reasons, one of the ways to solve this is to tighten the muscle that it's, wor- or I'm sorry, lengthen the muscle that it's working against. And then your knee can bend more easily and it won't take as much force from the hamstrings and therefore it'll eliminate that cramping. So what, can- so what am I supposed to do? You're supposed to stretch your thigh muscles, uh, but not so aggressively. Oh, okay. Right? Just back, just That's why. More. So you're trying to pull your foot back harder than what your thigh mu- muscles are allowing to happen. So your hamstrings have to work extra hard, right? Sure. So the other thing that you could do is uh, put a loop of an exercise band around your, let's say your right foot is the right leg is the one that you're stretching. So you, you loop an a exercise band around that right ankle and you pull it up and around your shoulder. And that pulls your foot back towards the table for you. So now you don't have to use the hamstring muscle to pull the foot back. That tube is pulling it back for you. Oh, sure. Just use that. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 We were filming that for a short for our channel the other day, that stretch you recommend. And we had one of my coworkers who's a gal doing it. And I was very upset because it was super easy for her. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Not for me at all. I was like, this is hard. She's like, no, it's not. Yeah, you'll just have to find another Olympic sport. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right. Last question is from Peaceful Bay. I have a knee injury, torn meniscus 17 years ago, a fall 18 months ago. After the fall, my knee won't straighten. Have been rehabbing with exercises, hydro, and weights, but no better. What could be the cause? Yeah, this is great. Uh, So I have a story about this in my upcoming book, Solving the Pain Puzzle. and. Folks, if you're interested, I've got a few of those chapters for free to read up on my website at rickolderman.com. And you can pre-order the book. My goal is to become the first physical therapist to be on the New York Times bestsellers list. So please purchase it. But anyway, I think one of the stories might be that one. Anyway, uh, it, it goes, uh, one, of, one of the parts of that story is that a, a gentleman flew in from New York uh, to see me whose knee couldn't straighten. He had just had meniscal repair surgery and no one could figure out why he couldn't straighten his knee. He had, you know, all sorts of, you know, expensive tests and specialists looking at this thing, couldn't figure it out. And so what it ended up being, and we solved it in like five minutes. So what it ended up being was, uh, if you remember, I was talking about that popliteus muscle in the back of the knee. So uh, it runs from the inside of the muscle, uh, inside of the lower leg bone. This is the back of the knee, by the way. It runs from the inside of the lower leg bone to the outside of the upper leg bone. So it causes rotation of the knee joint. And so it often gets in spasm when there is trauma to the knee. Well, you definitely had trauma. And so uh, simply massaging that muscle, and I'll I'll tell you, uh, will will probably solve your entire problem. Uh, But I I mean, this is my go-to whenever I see someone who's post-surgery. And you know, we, we, got, we got to get that range of motion to get that knee really straight, right? Well, rather than force it down, what I've learned to do over the years is just simply ma- massage the popliteus, which has become in spasm because of the surgery. And once we release that spasm, the knee, the knee just melts down. I mean, I, I usually see 15 to 20 degrees of reduction of knee flexion uh, after just simply massaging the popliteus, and it doesn't cause the patient any pain. And if I try and force the knee down without massaging that, guess what? It's going to bounce back up and it's going to be causing lots of pain because that popliteus muscle is rotating the knee joint and putting the knee joint in a position it doesn't want to be in. And now you're trying to force it to lengthen in a rotated position. And it's saying, no, 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 that's not going to happen here. So try that out. 
kind of sad I don't treat people anymore because I learned all these tips from you and <laughs> I can only apply them to myself or people I know directly. Yeah, they're they're great party tricks. <laughs> <laughs> Watch this. All right. Uh, where could people find more information about you or purchase your programs? Uh, well, uh, if you go to rickolderman.com, I have all of my downloadable home programs to solve pain from head to toe. I also have my practitioner's program there that teaches practitioners how to solve pain from the systems standpoint. I have chapters from my new book coming out that you can read or listen to and pre-order the new book. I, I really, the purpose of writing that book is to give people hope because my point of view is very unique in rehab. And uh, this is, I believe why a lot of people have chronic pain is because they haven't been looked at from the system standpoint. So this book kind of goes more deeply into Hey, what am I talking about? How do, how have I solved all these people's pain? And so I, I kind of go through different cases in the book showing how I solved it using this information. Uh, and if you type in uh, fixing you all, uh, well, no, Bob and Brad, you have a Bob and Brad code, I think we created, right, Mike? Yeah. If you type in Bob and Brad, you get uh, 20% off of all of the downloadable home programs, as well as um, the practitioner's training program. Unfortunately, you can't get it off my new book because that's through my publisher and, you know, they don't issue coupons. Uh, so that's where you find my information as well as other free stuff. I've got a free ebook on there. The somatics audio lessons are there that we mentioned uh, that are free and then uh, my blog and so forth. Oh, and I have a podcast too. talk about pain. Not as popular as yours, but <laughs> ours is rather it's new. Something. It's not super popular yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's it called? Right. Talk about pain. Talk about pain. Okay. I'll make sure to link that down below if people want to find it out. Yeah. So, anything else you want to add? Oh, I think that's it. Um, yeah. yeah. There, there. I mean, there are solutions to all of this stuff, guys. There, you're bumping up into these problems because people have been looking at you from a component standpoint, looking at just the knee or just the hip or whatever, and you need a system solution. And this is unique, I think, in the rehab world. And I'm that's my goal is to try and get this kind of information out there. Well, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.